Bridge Town. And uh, we just heard there that the retraction of this strong back is getting underway. Did they cancel? And the countdown is over. They just have a natural hold. Uh, this means we'll uh, not be seeing a launch of the Falcon 9 tonight. Okay. Uh -huh. SpaceX has already ended it. So we've been heading south trying to get away from winter up in northern Ohio, but one of the reasons we're on this trip also is our destination is Cape Canaveral, Florida. We're trying to see a launch. I saw a little bit of a launch from Myrtle Beach. It was supposed to come right across the coast in front of us, but unfortunately we were clouded in and we weren't able to see much of that launch. I saw about three or four seconds of it in the horizon. It would have been cool to see it go across the sky for a couple minutes, but that just wasn't going to happen. And it's always a crapshoot when it comes to these things. So now there's going to be another launch tonight. The trajectory of that launch is actually going away. It'll be launching from Cape Canaveral and heading towards the Bahamas. But I think the skies might be clear enough here and we might be close enough to uh, see it go off in the horizon for a period of time. Oh, I see it. Yeah, I'm going to say that's it. Again, clouds played a role in this viewing, but we did manage to capture a glimpse of it. Happens tomorrow, we'll be heading towards Cape Canaveral, and there's supposed to be a launch scheduled for Wednesday. Today's Sunday, so we're crossing our fingers that that launch will still stay intact. It would be nice if they also scheduled a couple more. We're going to be down there for six days. I've been watching them on a couple different apps for rocket launches. You can narrow it down to the location you want to keep an eye on. So I've been keeping an eye on the Florida coast. When we first left, there were actually three launches scheduled in the six day period that we're going to be down there. Then it went down to two, then it went down to one, then it went down to zero, then it went back up to two, and now it is back to one. So I'm crossing my fingers that we at least get to see one. It would be nice if they would schedule another one in the meantime, but who knows how that's going to work out. We'll just have to wait till tomorrow. It's very pretty in this area. There's a lot of grasslands, a lot of swamp areas. Uh, there's tides. These areas are affected by the tides. There's a lot of people that do crabbing. They throw some chicken in a basket, set it in the water, and see if they can catch any blue crabs primarily around here. It's very breezy today, which is good because there's been a lot of those no see out and I've got bites all up and down my arm and pretty itchy, but uh, I guess it's the time of year for that. A lot of pollen is out right now too. So I'm staying here in Fort McAllister, just outside of Savannah, south of Savannah, Georgia, by about 10 miles, and it's a beautiful state campground site. One of the things that's changed, I think, over the years though, is that this is very pretty with all the trees and all the greenery around here, but I think more desirable sites now are people that are looking for an open area site and less trees because of one, solar panels, and then two is internet connections like satellites or uh, cell phone signals. So it's become more desirable to have an open sky, but I've learned a couple tricks and I've been using Starlink now for a little over a year and it's gotten better and better because there's more and more satellites going up every day. So when I initially got Starlink, if we were in a tree covered area like this, Year, last year it was pretty much a no-go for getting a signal. It probably wouldn't be even worth your time and very spotty. You would have more outages than being online. But one thing I did learn is that if you have your dish and let's say you are in a canopy of trees like this, the first thing you want to do if you want to experiment a little bit is try to find an area that is just open straight up, that you just have a pocket of sky that's open straight up. Because what the satellite dish is going to want to do initially when you turn it on is it's going to go flat and look straight up and it's going to help determine what its orientation is and it'll also determine what the best position it's going to be for picking up satellites in the area. So it might face north in some areas, it might face south in other areas, and once it determines that position, then you can play around a little bit 
So right now it is facing in this direction here, but there's a bunch of trees in the way. So you know that the satellites are over there. So now you can pick this up, move it, and place it to where it's a little bit clearer in that facing sky. And I've done that a couple times since we've been down here. It's working really good right now. And also it worked in our previous can site, but we had outages probably about every five, six minutes. That would last for about 10, 15 seconds. Okay, if you're surfing the internet or using YouTube and you're buffering, if you're streaming a movie or something, you're definitely gonna get the buffering signal and it's also going to have to get reset several times because the IP address might change from going offline back to online and it's almost like re-logging into your account, but it's gonna maybe start you over again at the beginning of the movie. It's kind of a pain, but it is doable. It is a little bit better than before. Certainly if you have clear skies though, that's the way to go. But most campgrounds are not like that. If you go out west, you're more of a chance to have nice clear skies and open areas. But out east where we're going right now, everything has been a canopy of trees everywhere. And so far it's been pretty good. In West Virginia, we had a lot of trees around and we were able to capture a good signal by, by maneuvering the dish around a little bit. Same thing in the Myrtle Beach area and the same thing in Charleston. But so far it's, it's worked for us every place we went to. We just have to manipulate a little bit how we got it all set up. Okay, so hopefully we'll have an uneventful ride tomorrow and we'll catch you in Cape Canaveral. All right, we've entered Florida. We're staying at the Manatee Hammock Campground, which is a county-run campground that is on the water. It's a little bit tighter quarters than we've been used to, especially when we got spoiled in Georgia. But one nice feature about this campground is it's right on the water, and right across from the water is NASA, the Kennedy Space Center, and Cape Canaveral. So this is gonna be very convenient if a launch should go off because we really don't have to travel anywhere. We could just watch it from the bank of the water and hopefully crossing our fingers, there's one scheduled for Wednesday. Now the large white building is a NASA assembly building. A lot of history there, but to the right of it is launch pad 39A. 39A is frequently used, especially for Starlink satellite launches. And that's precisely the type of launch that is scheduled for Wednesday. That's gonna be two days from now. We have our RV all set up. We're gonna take a little bit of a break. There's a nice fishing pier that is part of the RV park. It's nice to come out here. There's a lot of fishermen that come out here and catch a variety of different types of fish. The water though isn't very deep. I would say it's about four or five feet by the pier. And the tides don't seem to affect it very much. Usually pretty tired after the travel day, so we're going to call it early tonight, and tomorrow we're going to take a little field trip. The Kennedy Space Center is our destination today. It's not very far. It was about a 10-minute ride from the RV park, so pretty convenient. Just across the water over there, off of a nice large bridge. We lucked out. It was complimentary parking. We did get a two-day pass, though. I can tell you after touring this place that you need a good eight hours to go through everything. We opted for a two-day pass. That way we didn't have to rush around too much. We could cut it short the first day, go take Willow out, and then come back on the second day and just pick up where we left off. I will tell you a couple personal favorites of mine. One was seeing the Apollo rocket in all its glory. Another was taking a bus trip up north to see the NASA control center, the actual control center for the Apollo program. This is 
not Universal Studios. No, sir, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> It was pretty neat to see the actual control center for the Apollo program, also thinking about all the history that took place in here. They also did a nice job with simulating what it must have felt like from having an actual rocket launch nearby. With rattling rafters, shaking seats, vibrating walls, it was pretty cool. The Atlantis display was also another great presentation. If you have kids, there's a lot of activity for kids here for hands-on stuff and hands-off. In the Heroes and Legends building, they also reassembled the original Mercury Mission Control Center. So all in all, a lot of things to do there. There's an IMAX theater that changes the movie frequently and just a lot of displays to check out. This area remains a refuge for 150,000 species of plants and animals. I want to introduce you to Becky Bolt, who has been a NASA wildlife ecologist here at KSC for nearly 35 years. Becky, what kind of wildlife can we expect to see here today? We have lots and lots of different kinds of wildlife. We have over 400 species that occur out here on the Space Center. Look in the ditches and you'll see lots of wading birds, tall herons, egrets, ibises. There's all there's several species of those. And I can. All right, we did come here to see a launch though, so let's get back to that. Scheduled for Wednesday, 7.29 p.m. Now it's moved up to 7.51 p.m. Now it's at 9.25 p.m. And we have confirmation that the loading of liquid oxygen aboard the first stage is complete. So you're looking at uh, a satellite view of Pad 39A, historic Pad 39A, the site of uh, many Apollo space shuttle missions. It's been taken over by SpaceX and has been used uh, so far. Everything seemed to be going good. The count ended up stopping at about 2 minutes and 3 seconds because I believe the tower clamps would not release. This means we'll uh, not be seeing a launch of the Falcon 9 tonight. Okay. So I packed up all my cameras and we uh, went back to the RV for the night. The next evening we're back at it again. I got three other cameras set up. Karen's got one, I got one, I got one on a tripod, and then I have another one behind us on a selfie stick. Watchport is running. Let's say hold. So it appears the same issue as the previous night happened again. So it's been rescheduled for the next day, tomorrow evening. Packed up all my cameras. It's the next day now and it's getting a little breezy out. The clouds are starting to build and we're a little concerned with the weather. It was to go off right around sunset and now it's pushed back about another two hours. So I readjusted all my cameras to shoot in the evening sky. We only have one day left before we head out, so hopefully it's going to go off tonight. Here 
goes. This is the Falcon 9 rocket. It is two stages, so there will be a second stage that uh, will ignite. You'll actually see the uh, flames go out for a few seconds and then another uh, ignition will occur. Once that happens, the first stage will have a controlled re-entry and it's going to land on a drone ship out in the ocean. But sometimes, periodically, it will land on land uh, near the Cape and I'm told that it gives off a pretty good sonic boom when that happens. Just kind of bouncing back and forth on some of the different video I took with different cameras. Main engine cut off. Stage separation confirmed. And back ignition. I was happy that we were able to get to see a launch before we left. It just squeaked one in. At the beginning of our trip, it looked like we were going to be able to see two launches, and then it almost seemed like we weren't going to see any launch. So I'm glad that that all worked out. The campsite's not too bad. I think we would come back here. We were a little spoiled in Georgia because the campgrounds there had some pretty spacious campsites. Our campsite here is pretty tight. We're pretty close to our neighbors. Uh, definitely can't use a fire ring or you want to sit outside or picnic or anything like that. It's just too tight for that. It didn't bother us too much. There are some other sites here that are pretty nice, a little bit bigger, a little bit more spacious, but they're kind of far in between. A lot of folks come down here for the winter from up north and they hang out here for three, four months. So they have some dedicated campsites. So it's just a luck of the draw how it all works out. But I appreciate everybody watching. Hope you join, subscribe to these videos. Click on that little bell when you want to know a new one that's coming out and keep an eye on us. Take care, everybody. Oh, we'll see you in Georgia, I guess. <laughs>